Welcome back. So we're talking about data science, and we've talked about how you can ask questions uh, and answer them with data, and that it's this, this feedback process. So I really want now to talk about the nature of data. So uh, the nature of, of your data, because this plays a big role in what kinds of questions you can ask and answer, how you collect the data, how you store it, analyze, visualize the types of models you can build with machine learning. So the nature of data is very, very critical. And there's lots of types of data out there. There's a huge variety, big data, sparse data, uh, and everything in between. And nowadays, we hear a lot about big data. This is kind of a big um, buzzword, big data. So everyone is competing to see whose data is bigger. Uh, you know, companies are, are buying new equipment to measure things more accurately so they can collect more and more data. Um, oftentimes, you know, big data has benefits. So there's been a lot of successes from big data. So think of Google image search or even Google search in general. Um, huge success of big data. But there's a lot of times, a lot of occasions where you're collecting big redundant data, data that is not actually adding value by just collecting more of it. Um, and so I think it's not always important to stay in the big data regime, but sometimes we want to be thinking about what I'm going to call smart data. This is uh, a bio-inspired principle. Uh, so I think about you know, animals a lot. Insects, when they're flying, they're not collecting huge data about their environment. They have very targeted sensors. They have strain-sensitive neurons on their wings, a few of them, that are collecting just the right information. Then they listen to, to these strain sensors the smart data to inform them about the, the system they're interacting with. So sometimes big data makes sense. Uh, sometimes you want to go to the smart data limit where you actually learn to listen to a massive subsample of your data. Instead of all of the data, you listen to some of it that's maximally informative. Okay. Um, so let's talk about the types of data you have, the nature of your data. So Oftentimes, your data, you know, it might come in a big Excel spreadsheet. That happens all the time. Someone sends me an Excel spreadsheet, so it's not always in a fancy database. Um, you know, you might email your colleague and say, hey, I need this data to answer this question, and he emails you or she emails you a big Excel spreadsheet. Okay? And in that spreadsheet, there might be numbers and letters and categories and all kinds of messy stuff. That's what you normally find. Uh, so there's numerical data. Um, numerical data are things, you know, numbers like uh, 0.972 is a numerical data you might expect to see. Uh, they might be categorical. Um, so categorical. So for example, if I have a bunch of images of cats and dogs, I might have a label. Is it category A or category B? Or is this part type A or type B or type C? So categorical data comes in a few categories, you know, in this case, A, B, or C. And then there's, uh, there's cases which are less, less clear cut, not just numbers or categories, but something that's somewhat in between. So um, these are called ordinals. So let's say you have a five star recommender system, like a rating system. So I have one through five stars. It's discrete, you know, kind of like these categories, but there is an order to those. Five is bigger than one. So this is called ordinal. And in the real world, what you're going to have are mixed data types. You're going to have images, which are millions of numerical values, millions of pixels, each with a numerical value. And each image might have a category or a few categories. There's a dog and a cat, something like that, categories, describing the numerical data. Um, so that, that's very common. Another key distinction about the nature of your data is whether or not it's high dimensional or low dimensional. Okay, so uh, high dimensional data, and this is a very uh, subjective uh, categorization, high dimensional and low dimensional. So one person's uh, low dimensional might be someone else's high dimensional. But I'll give you some extreme examples. Okay, so high dimensional data are things like um, Images are inherently, there's many degrees of freedom or dimensions used to describe a megapixel image. There's a million pick pieces of pixel information that you use to describe an image. So if I have an image um, here, let's make it a cat. Then this, uh, this 
image data is high dimensional by nature of the fact that there's a million pieces of information to describe that. Low dimensional, um, I mean, to some extent for humans, anything higher than three dimensional is high dimensional because we can see in three dimensions. Uh, but low dimensional is, you know, smaller than that. So maybe if I have one measurement in time, you know, a time series of one measurement or two measurements, I'll give you an example. Low dimensional, um, maybe I'm running an experiment. I'm trying to design a new super alloy. And it's super expensive. It cost me $50,000 to bake and test this new super alloy. And after this very expensive procedure, I get out four numbers. Okay, I get out these four material properties that describe that material. That's kind of a low dimensional output. There's only a few numbers it costs a lot to get, and I only get a few numbers out. Whereas, you know, images are cheap and very high dimensional. Okay, so low dimensional, high dimensional, that's a key, a key distinction. Um, another major distinction in, uh, in data science and the nature of data is whether or not your data comes with labels. So to some extent, um, is it labeled? or not. And this makes a huge difference in terms of what machine learning algorithms you can use to model your data. So if you have labels, let's say in this case, it didn't just say it wasn't just a cat, but it, it, I knew that it came from the category. There was this label that this is a cat. And maybe someone else, you know, I also have images of dogs and someone labels those dogs. So if I have labels, I can do a lot with my data. I can build models that will tell me what is the difference between dog and cat. And I can build an algorithm that in the future, when I take a picture, it'll tell me, oh, that's a dog or that's a cat. So labeled data versus data that's not labeled makes a big difference. And there's a huge distinction. There's almost like two families of algorithms, whether or not there are labels or are not. So if there are labels, then this is called supervised learning algorithms. And if there's not labels, then this is called unsupervised. Okay? And so these are huge categories of machine learning algorithms based on whether it's supervised or unsupervised. Okay, good. Uh, another key distinction that I think about a lot is not just how big my data is in terms of kind of the dimension of one example. So I think of these as example data. But how many examples do I have? Do I have many or few examples? Okay, so that's another really, really important, uh, important distinguishing feature. So, for example, Google presumably has many high dimensional images in their image library. Um, if I take a a time series measurement, I have some sensor and it's measuring one thing, but I'm measuring it at, at you know, every millisecond for 10 hours. I have many examples of low dimensional data. Okay? Um, that's interesting. And in the flip side, I might have data where I have lots of measurements, but only a very few examples. Um, so what are some examples of this? I think of the Human Genome Project. I might have one person where I've sequenced their whole genome. So I have all of this massive high dimensional data for one person's genome or maybe, maybe five people. You know, it's very expensive to sequence a whole genome or at least it was 10 years ago. And so I might have a very few examples, but a ton of data for those few examples. And so that's often called deep data where you have like a ton of data, but not that many examples. Okay? And I think that the kind of intersection of many or few and high and low dimensional, there's some really interesting uh, categories of problems. So typically neural networks, for example, work really, really well when you have many uh, examples. So neural networks are great for many examples of labeled data. Not so great for a few example data. Okay? Uh, so that's a huge, a huge distinction. Um, you know, what, what just general type of data? Uh, is it high D or low D? Does it have labels? Are there many or few? Um, and then a, another one I think of, and this is the last one I'm going to write down, and I think of this a lot because I work with uh, physical systems, engineering systems, systems from science where we know Newton's laws exist and are, are true, uh, and I'm dealing with systems that are evolving in time according to physics. Is your data temporal in nature? Uh, is, is it kind of temporal? Uh, 
or uh, does it come from physics? Is there some physics or dynamics that describe your data? That's also very important. So if are my many examples correlated in time, or are they kind of discrete examples like picture of cat, picture of dog? Okay, is it a movie or just a sequence of random images? That's how I think of it. Okay. Uh, and these are, are just, you know, some of my favorite categorizations of the nature of data. There's a lot I'm glossing over. You can have a lot of more subtlety in mixed types. You know, in the Human Genome Project, presumably they collected extra information about that person. Uh, you know, what is their diet? What's their blood pressure? What's their age? Um, things like that. So you have um, extra information, and this all goes into practical questions about how would you store the data? How would you collect the data? How would you, what computational hardware and architectures would you use? You know, what databases would you use to store the data? What machine learning algorithms would you use to process the data? Can I do it on my laptop or do I need a supercomputer? Those are all very important questions. Um, and then the last thing I want to talk about, and, and this is, uh, you know, if I'm going to build a model, a machine learning model for this data to answer questions, I also need to know which of the data I have that I'm going to train my model on, what are the inputs and what are the outputs? And hopefully you've collected all of this rich data so you are measuring both the inputs and the outputs of some process. But you might want to then use that model to predict the outputs given new inputs. So you have to decide in the future what's going to be easy to measure and what's going to be valuable to predict. Um, and so that's, you know, a, a really important kind of human step in this process is determining from this data what are you going to call inputs and outputs in this process. And so, of course, as with everything, I'm a big fan of feedback uh, in general, there are these kind of inherent feedback signals throughout this entire process. So, you know, the type of data you have determines often what types of inputs and outputs and what types of things you can model, what questions you can ask and answer. Again, that tells you, you know, should I be collecting more data or listening to a subset of the data? And this is kind of an interesting cycle. Okay, so you got to think about what's the nature of your data. It's critical in what types of questions you can ask and answer. Okay, thank you.